Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're so glad to see everybody here today. And of course, all those who may be watching on Channel 6 or across the world, you could say, on the World Wide Web. We do have a few lip watchers that do watch us all over the United States and, and overseas as well. So I'm real pleased about that. We're glad you're with us this morning. In the bulletin, you'll find our announcements this morning. Just want to highlight a couple of those this morning. Um, Kate Holland's going to be playing. She's not in the bulletin, but she's going to be playing right after the children sing this morning. And uh, so we want to definitely lift her up for that as well. And, and it's going to be an awesome uh, piano solo this morning, right? There we go. A uh, couple other things. Uh, don't forget, Yet Set Potluck Luncheon is uh, coming up on Wednesday. Our Lenten luncheon schedule is in the bulletin as well, and something worthwhile is coming up in March. So I want to make sure that uh, you get signed up for that. Reservations are required for that, so make sure that uh, you get signed up for that. It's going to be an awesome time. As we come now to this point, and we put the world outside of these doors behind us, and take and focus all of our attention to God. Let us begin worship this morning. Jesus calls us. Gather with the crowds who seek to touch Jesus. Come to, be, to hear and be healed. We are poor and hungry, in need of food for our souls. Cursed are those who put their trust in human beings and make flesh their arm. Blessed are those who put their trust in God and find their hope in Christ Jesus. Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of of those who have fallen asleep. Our faith is not in vain, and our hope is sure. We rejoice and leap for joy at the good news. Now let us take a moment to greet one another with signs of God's love and peace.
back to their seats. We're going to do our songs of praise and worship.
were broken hearted and bandages their wounds. God bandages the broken hearted and their wounds. Psalm 147 3. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6 5. song was meant to just be a celebration of all the church can do when they actually work together. We are known for three things, good music, good preaching, and good food. God has put me here because he wants me to make a really big difference for this church. I have been a United Methodist my whole life. I always tell people everyone is included. Oh, we are church people. Kayakers and rafters, a river, it is our church. But it sure is nice to have somebody to pray with when you're out there. When the congregation started growing beyond the capacity of the home where we were worshiping, we, the idea of putting up a new church came on our mind. We're going out into the community and doing stuff for people who may never walk in the walls of these church. I think it speaks to our heritage and to who we are as United Methodists in great measure. There are lots of social service agencies that are feeding people, clothing people, teaching people English. We're not a social service agency, we're a church. We're followers of Jesus. You never know when a prayer is going to have an impact. You never know where that's going to land or who that person is going to be. I'm proud to be a United Methodist because of what life has been for me as a United Methodist. It's given me the joy of fellowship, that we all have our calling and this has been mine. As a United Methodist pastor, I'm very proud that people that come here experience grace. They may have been told some things that have really broken their spirit, but when they come through our doors, they get love and they get acceptance. Our God is able, more than able, every dream.
You know, I wish they wouldn't put food on there. <laughs> but we are known for food as United Methodists, so as we come to this time of our worship service this morning, it's a time of prayer. You'll find listed in the back of your bulletin our prayer concerns that we have for the week. Don't forget if you also have a prayer concern you'd like to share with the church, feel free to fill out the prayer request and turn it into the offering plate or you can call the church office, or you can get on the church app and put it on there, and it goes directly to the office as well. As we come together as the church, let us go to him in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Father God, we just uh, come to you this morning, Lord. We lift you high, because Lord, you are our God. You have raised us you continue to bless us, you continue to nurture us, and you care for us. And it's all because you love us. You placed us here to worship you, give thanks to you, to serve you, and to share your good news with all those who would listen. Father, we know that your grace is abundant, that we don't deserve it, but yet you continually give it to us. Lord, we thank you for that. Your ultimate gift was our Lord Jesus Christ, who came on this earth to live amongst us, to walk hand in hand with us, and ultimately die for us and for our sins. Lord, what better gift, what more of a gift could you ever give us than your son to die for our sins? There's not one. Lord, we come to you this morning as we pray and we have troubled hearts amongst us. Those of us who are amongst us have been uh, sick, under the weather, in the hospital. Father, we know that there are those suffering out there from yet another senseless shooting. Father, while we don't understand why all these take place, Lord, we know that your love is there with them and with us to comfort us, to give us the guidance, to draw us close to you, Father. Father, we give you thanks for that. We give you our praise this morning, Lord. Lord, without you, we would be nothing. But with you, we are everything. Because you instill hope in us. You let us shine our lights bright. And to show our love for others. Lord, we thank you. But Lord, we still are troubled. We still tend to hold things in. We forget, Lord, that when we release those things to you, that, Lord, that burden and those shackles are lifted off of us, Lord. You've already paid the price. Lord, remind us daily that we can do that. Father, we come to you this morning in our moment of silence here to lift up our own personal prayers to you this morning. And now, Lord, we come to you to pray the prayer your Son taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. (coughs) 
Our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. Listen for God's word for you this morning. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great many people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their disease. And those who touched and those uh, who were touched by unclean spirits were cured. And all of the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what they, their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are a lot of different reasons that uh, people go into ministry, primarily uh, feeling a sense of God's call to, to do that is, is one of those. Um, like a lot of uh, different life decisions and directions that you can make and take. There are uh, a lot of great things that are about it. There are things that are drawbacks about it. Uh, one of the fun things in being in ministry is, is how people uh, often show places of kindness for you. Um, someone did that for Steve and me this week. They um, bought us candy bars and they put them in our uh, box. But, you know, they couldn't just do that. They had to kind of twist it a little. Um, they put in my box a candy bar that was for the OSU Cowboys. And they put in Steve's box one that was for the OU Sooners, you know. Um, you know, it was really a beautiful thing, a nice thing, except, you know, they just... They couldn't help twist it in a bit because it, it's the opposite, you know, teams that we kind of root for. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, but that's one of the neat things, you know, about being a pastor is, you know, whenever, uh, whenever you're, you receive those kind of little acts of kindness. Um, uh, it all eats the same. It does, it does. I, we, we did kind of correct it, but we decided not to, uh, you know, change it. We wanted that person to know that we got it straight. So we left it, we switched them, but left them in, the, in our, our boxes for a little bit, you know, so that they could at least see that we, we, we corrected their, their error, you know. But uh, more Steve's error than mine, but... Uh, <laughs> so, so one of the things that, um, you know, Henry Nowen, beautiful spiritualist, a Catholic priest, writer, um, he said that, kind of pinpointing it, one of the great um, temptations of pastoral ministry is wanting to be liked. Um, it's a great temptation, wanting to be liked. And uh, he said that there ought to be something in the pastor that makes them shiver a bit whenever someone says, we just love our pastor, or, um, you know, good sermon, that was a great sermon today. Uh, 
Because Jesus says, you know, woe to you when all speak well of you, for that's what they said of the false prophets. There ought to be something in you that, that while, while we all desire to be loved, we all desire to be uh, appreciated, um, there's something about the truth of the gospel sometimes that may not always be particularly popular or even sometimes easy to take. Jesus, in our lesson for today, um, shares what we call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are a part of what we generally refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's a group of teachings, a beautiful section that really, I think, stand at the absolute core, the heart of who Jesus is. Uh, the Beatitudes begin them, and they are his teachings. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, and, and here's a little teaching thing. I know I've said this to you many times before, but this is just a beautiful way to illustrate it. Um, we call it the Sermon on the Mount because in Matthew's Gospel, it says Jesus is on the mountain when he delivered this sermon. And we like Matthew because uh, of the way Matthew shares with us the Beatitudes. Luke says he came down onto a level place. Some translations say on a plane. We want to even it out. It really is le a level place, but we want to even it out so that it's either a mountain or a plane. We get the, we, you know, one or the other. But to a level place, which is fascinating because it, it really illustrates so well what Luke is trying to tell us about who Jesus is and how Matthew uh, is telling us about who Jesus is. It could be that each of them tell the story of what might have been one occasion, um, or it could be that maybe Jesus told this I wouldn't put it past a preacher to use the same stories over again in the course of uh, uh, their ministry. Um, maybe he told it in one context with the light shining on a particular area and on another occasion tells it with the light shining on another area. Um, so it's not about Matthew being correct or Luke being correct. Uh, they both are correct. It's just that Luke is what we're focusing on today. Um, for Matthew, when Jesus delivers this beatitude, um, he does it from the mountain, the way like Moses went to the mountain and received the law, and that this is the new commandment, the new way we are to live. Um, it's, it's, it comes in a way, it comes across in that way. Matthew, all the way through his gospel, or Luke, all the way through his gospel, um, tells us about Jesus wanting to, us to know the universality of Jesus' love for us and the ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus comes down from the mountain to a level place where all of them, and, and isn't that imagery perfect? There's a leveling. There's a leveling, and Jesus is there with us. Um, the imagery is beautiful and it shades the light of how we see it. Um, we like Matthew, I think, in part, because we're rich. You may not feel it, but if you live in this country, you're rich. You have far more than most of the world's population. Um, and, and then even within our country, uh, if you just look at median incomes, we do all right. We tend to be above that, members of our congregation. By most standards, uh, we may not feel it in our lives, but we land as those who are rich. We certainly are not, in most cases, those who are poor. Although sometimes we, uh, we have struggle and we have difficulty. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says, blessed are the poor. End of, the, end of the sentence, you know, and it stops there. Blessed are the poor. And um, there's something really important about that. Jesus cares about physical poverty, physical need. Jesus heals people whose lives are broken because 
he wants our lives to be whole. And so he says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Matthew, you might remember, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I like Matthew. I can be poor in spirit often. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We want righteousness. Luke, blessed are the hungry. They'll be filled. He speaks to the real physical need. Blessed are you who are weeping now. For one day you'll laugh. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake when you're excluded for my sake. You ever know what it's like to be excluded, to not be included, um, left out, not invited? Everybody else gets an invite, but you don't get it. Um, We sometimes know that, and it can hurt to be excluded. Blessed are you who are excluded for my sake. Um, He seems to be reaching out to those who are in need. Luke is our focus today. We might want to focus on spiritual hunger, spiritual thirst for righteousness, those who are poor in spirit, um, because that would include us all. But this blessing is for those who are on the underside today. Um, it's, It's focused on those who are in deepest need. Do you remember, I I loved, uh, I still wear Nike running shoes, you know. I I love Nike shoes. They're great equipment. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other great ones. I just have my loyalty, and I stick to those things I know. Um, Born a Methodist, I'm going to die a Methodist. I mean, I'm kind of a loyalist that way. Um, I still wear my Nikes. And remember that campaign they had several years ago, just do it. You know, just do it. And... um, you know, a lot of us might wear the shoes and not do it. Uh, it encourages, just go do it, go do it. There's a moral imperative to it. Go, get out of there. Uh, sometimes we need a moral kick in the butt to get us going, right? Can I say that in church? We sometimes need that. Um, uh, my mom would, would come wash my mouth out with soap right now, so j- just know that. Um, I, you know, I, there's plenty of guilt that I feel for having said that already. Um, that sometimes we do. We need that kick in the rear to get us going. And uh, just do it. Go do it. Quit talking about it. Go do it. Soren Kierkegaard, great Danish philosopher, was so sick and tired of the church run or the government run church in uh, his country. Uh, he said, "You know, I just wish that there'd be some honest conversation with people." Now, one man argues in favor of Christianity, another one argues against it, and they go and debate it all, and then they leave, and it doesn't make any difference in their life, one way or the other. They live exactly the same. Do we live that way sometimes? Does it make the difference in how we live? Sometimes we need the moral imperative to make us go do and to care and to make a difference in the world. But that's not the sermon today. Jesus' sermon, there is no ought, there is no should, there is no go and do likewise. It is a blessing. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who are persecuted and left out for my sake. It is a blessing that is just given. And it's just shared with the rest of the world. It's not uh, no moral imperative, no go and do. It's simply to be. Just be and let God's blessing rest upon you. Beatitude has nothing to do with that. It's a lot like God's unmerited favor. Uh, God just lets it rest upon those who it needs to rest. Jesus sends it out, just sends it out into the world. And that those who need to hear it, hear it, and it rests upon them. And they receive the blessing. Um, Reminds me in a way 
of another parable that Jesus taught that kind of makes people mad. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. He's the one who said it, you know. If you want to be mad at somebody, be mad at him. It's not me. Um, I'd rather, you know, have it all spiritualized because I can meet all that criteria, you know. Um, So if you're upset with somebody, be upset with Jesus. But he has one sermon or parable he tells about a man who goes and hires people to work in his field and he hires some at the beginning of the day and he hires some late in the morning, some at noontime, all the way up to about five o'clock he hires some. And then whenever he pays them at the end of the day, he brings forward those who came and started work last and he pays them a full day wage. They came to work at five, they got off at 5.30, six, whatever time it was and he pays them for the whole day. And he comes through, and you know that those who've then worked the full day, they think, oh man, this is, we're gonna get a bonus here. No, he pays them all the same wage. Every one of them, they all get the same pay. And, you know, of course, those that got, who worked the whole day, they were kind of upset. They were grumbling. Says the master said, do you begrudge me for my generosity? I, I, usually I like modern translations, but that, uh, there's something about the old that uh, I just love. Do you, would you begrudge me for my generosity? If I choose to be generous, what business is of yours? You have been paid for what you were to be given, he said, to those who came and worked the whole day. They still got their full pay. They just didn't get extra. And they were upset because others got the same that they did. Something about God's blessing that um, doesn't sit well with us always. It, um, it rests upon all the world, and we can receive it or not. Um, the thing is, it's about God, and it's not about us. Whenever God is blessing, it's about God, and it's not about us. They didn't deserve it, you know. It didn't say the poor are better people, that they are uh, morally uncorrupted. It didn't say anything like that. It just said blessed are the poor. It's about God and not those who did anything to deserve it or to not deserve it. It's what God chose to do. Um, It's an amazing thing. I, I usually won't do this, um, but it fits so appropriately for the text. Several weeks ago, someone in church, they wrote a little note on a card. They didn't sign it, but they wrote a little note on the card and put it in the offering plate and said, I really didn't enjoy the service today. (laughs) And, you know, the part of me who really likes to be liked wants people to enjoy it and wants there are people to get something from it. I want to have done my job well. I wanted worship to, to go well. And, um, and so I was a little bit, one, bothered with myself. Two, really bothered with the other person. Uh, it's a good thing I don't have anger issues because, you know, they could, you could get pretty angry over some things like that. But the more I thought about it, I finally came to the place that, you know, it's okay because it's really not about you. It was about worship for God. It was about worship for God. And, you know, there are days whenever it's not going to just hit home. Hopefully there's something that speaks to our life, our faith in the service. But not every time is it going to be, oh, wow, that was a five-star gourmet course. You know, it was was amazing. Um, not, Not always the case. When it's not, we have to remember, it's not about us. We can easily want to put ourselves at the center. It's about God. I could easily want to make it about me, but it's not about me. This is about God. It's about how we worship and we let ourselves be in God's presence. We can so easily let ourselves uh, get in the way get in the way of receiving God's blessing. The part of us that wants to be loved and cared for, the, the part of us that um, 
we just want to put ourselves into the, the middle of it. Um, I don't know if you, you all are familiar with uh, Clarence Jordan. Clarence Jordan was a pastor in the South. He fought hard. White Baptist pastor in the South fought hard um, against uh, segregation. Um, he was the one who put together, and maybe you all might remember it from the 70s, the Cotton Patch Gospel, and, uh, in, in which it told the story of uh, the gospel in relationship to the American South. Um, Clarence, he said, uh, was once asked about which version was better, Matthew or Luke, and he said this, if you have a lot of money, you'll probably say spiritual poverty. If you have little or no money, you'll probably say physical poverty. The, the rich will thank God for Matthew. The poor will thank God for Luke. Who's right? Chances are neither of them. For it is exactly this attitude of self-praise and self-justification and self-satisfaction that robs people of a sense of the greater need for the kingdom and its blessing in our lives. When one says, I don't need to be poor in things, I am poor in spirit, and another says, I don't need to be poor in spirit, I am poor in things, both are justifying themselves, and as they say in union, I don't need. With that cry on our lips, no one can repent. Isn't that true? You know, we can take whatever our circumstance in life might be and use that and put a roadblock right in the way of our ability to really receive the blessing that God intends to give us in our lives. God intends for there to be so much more for us, so much more in every way that we possibly can. And if we allow God's blessing to rest, it will rest. Um, what Jesus says is there will one day be a great eschatological leveling. And all of us will be the same. None any better, none any worse as we all stand before God. None who have any more, none who have any less. If you're driven by a vision of having more than others, then God's view of the world may be hard to take at times. But if you're driven by a vision that all will have enough, then you'll feel full no matter the circumstance. God has a great way of bringing it all back together. Gustavo Gutierrez um, he's often maligned by uh, the religious right because he's so leftist. He's a very leftist. Um, he was some the, called the father of liberation theology in Central America. He had this to write about it. It says, God has a preferential love for the poor, not because they are necessarily better than others, morally or religiously, but simply because they are poor and living in, human, uh, in an inhuman situation, it, and it's contrary to God's will. The ultimate basis for privileged position for the poor is not the poor themselves, but in God, in the gratuitous uh, uh, nature and universal, universality of God's agape love. God has great love for us all, and especially for those who are without. And it's not because they're better, it's just because of the nature of God. And that God has a desire for there to be a great leveling in our world. And the Beatitudes are not about go change it, they're about God's blessing just sent out to rest upon those. There are plenty of other sermons. There are plenty of other times where it, the, it's the moral imperative, but today it's not. Today it's just about whether you receive it or not, whether you can allow it to just be, just be the kingdom of God. 
Amen. If you will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of response, Marching to Zion. As we come now to share in our offerings, we remember that whatever we have was a gift to us from God. And as we share these, we share a portion of what God has granted to us. Let us now take this moment to prepare ourselves for the morning offering.
notes that he really enjoyed the service today. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Somebody really did enjoy the service. It's on the top of the offering plate. There we go. If you would, say, uh, please remain standing as we proclaim our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you will remain standing, we're going to do our song of sending forth. Some good 
play.